So just to introduce you, Max, so um, Dan is going to give the communicator pad some modes. So the reason for this talk is it links back to what I said in the um, early on. I talked about the sort of synchronous, asynchronous, uh, MPIS send, MPIB send um, variants, but then said that MPI send could be either buffered send, could be asynchronous, or could be synchronous send. Seems a bit weird, um, but this left is kind of trying to, uh, among other things, trying to explain why that's probably a useful thing. Whether it's useful or not, you need to understand what the implications are. Okay. Right. Okay, so I'll get started then. So um, there are three topics um, in this lecture. I um, hope everybody can hear me. Um, so modes, which is what David was just saying, um, so there are, there are quite a few modes. There are actually four, but we're only going to talk about three um, modes of sending an MPI. Then there's tags, which is something you might want to use, but you might not want to use. And then communicators um, as the third topic. So the meaning of um, the, the modes, it's, it's important to understood, understand um, what these modes uh, give you what their advantages are, what their disadvantages are, but um, more often um, exactly how you can use them in a safe way, in a correct way, um, rather than you know, making false assumptions about them and therefore potentially getting your program into a deadlock situation or um, something equally terrible. Um, so hopefully this, this lecture will give you some idea of, of some rules that you can apply, simple rules that you can apply of how to use these things, when you should use them, um, and how to use them correctly. Um, it is often useful to use tags, so we'll, there's one slide on tags. Um, and it is, if you're going to like, uh, write um, reasonably large pieces of code, you'll probably write it in, in various libraries, and then communicators become something you must use almost, than, rather than something you might like to use. Um, so, Let's start with modes. So David just mentioned there are um, S send, which is synchronous send, B send, which is buffered send, and send, which is the standard send. These are the, the three of the different modes. So S send is guaranteed to be synchronous. It's sort of fairly obvious from its name. What does synchronous actually mean in this case? Um, it means that the sender and the receiver will synchronize at some point during the communication. So that means that um, the send cannot complete before the receive has started, and the receive can't complete before the send has started. They will synchronize at some point. Um, so the routine won't, be, um, won't return, or it is safe to assume that um, the routine will not return until the message has been delivered. That's not quite true, but that's a safe assumption to make. You can assume the receive has finished as well. Um, a buffered send is guaranteed to be asynchronous. Um, the MPI library will copy the information from your buffer into its own into another buffer and send it from there. So you are safe to, to reuse the buffer as soon as bsend returns. But because bsend re has returned, doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that the message has been delivered. You can't assume that because it might not be, almost certainly won't be actually. Um, so standard mode send, it is legal for MPI, the MPI library to implement that pretty much however it likes. Um, standard choices for that implementation are to use um, a buffered send um, for small messages and to use a, a standard send, a synchronous send rather, for um, other messages. So you can't make really any assumptions about how send is going to, to work. Has it finished when, when the send call comes back to you? Has the message been delivered? Maybe. Um, so you need to assume the worst case. Whatever's worst for your application, that's what you must assume is going to happen, because it might on some machines and with some MPI libraries. So we'll go through a, a diagram. Um, so we've got process A and process B here. One's going to send and one's going to receive. Um, so, little arrow saying, um, process A is doing something. Um, so it then comes to a point where it wants to send some data to process B. So it calls S send. This is a synchronous send. So 
this um, routine cannot return until the message has arrived. Process B, on the other hand, is busy doing something else. Um, Non-MPI code. At some point, so, right, while B is doing something, it's busy. Um, process A is waiting in its S-send. It, it won't come back to the code, to the non-MPI code, until something happens. So process B eventually gets around to, to calling receive. Um, this means that the data transfer can now happen. So now they're both blocked in MPI. The data transfer will happen while they're both blocked in MPI. That's your synchronization point. And now both of once that data transfer is finished, both can return to, to user code. And off they go doing something else. It is now OK for X on process A to be overwritten um, because the data is left already. It's already in, in Y. And it's also now OK for Y to be read by process B. OK, so let's do the same thing with a buffered send. So process A is busy doing something. It comes to a point where it wants to send some data. It calls buffered send instead. So process B is away busy doing something, um, non-MPI code again. So what actually happens here? Well, this time, the MPI library will copy um, what's in X into some other buffer. Um, that means that it's now got a copy of the data, and it can, it can tell process A, go ahead, do whatever you like with, with variable X. Um, so the, the buffered send will return. Process A can overwrite its variable X. You can't guarantee that it's, it's um, actually arrived anywhere. It hasn't. It's arrived in that buffer, but it's actually not left process A yet. So process A is now free to do whatever it likes. At some point, um, process B will call the receive. Um, and the data transfer can now happen. This is now um, not connected with the activity of process A. So the buffer is now empty. The receive can return because the data transfer has happened. And process B is free to go away and do whatever it likes, including reading Y. So you can see that you can't make any assumptions here about when um, the data transfer actually happens relative to process A. You can with B still, because the receive won't return until it's arrived. So the receive is always synchronous um, in that the, it will only return when the data has arrived. Not much point in it doing so otherwise. Yeah, so if the, the receive is issued, in the diagrams, the receive is always issued after the send was issued. Um, that's not necessarily needed or required at all. Um, the receive could have been posted 10 minutes ago, and then finally the sender gets round to sending the data. What will happen is that the receive will just block until the send happens, until the data arrives. Um, so you don't necessarily have to make sure that the order is correct for any of these combinations. Um, it would actually be very difficult to, to force that anyway. Difficult to actually achieve that ordering because you'd need to send a message. But the whole point is that you're sending messages using this me mechanism. So where does the buffer space come from for a buffered send? So for a B send, um, the user provides a very large chunk of memory and MPI is then free to use that as buffer memory however it feels that that's useful. Um, if you run out of that memory, then a buffered send will fail. There's no backup. There's no you know, extra memory that it can use. It will just fail. Um, yeah, OK. So you can obviously store more than one buffered send in that space if there's enough space to do so. So problems with this, the synchronous send runs the risk of deadlock. Um, there's an example, I think, on the next slide. Um, if you write a correct program and you, you write the, the, the program in, a, in a, a, a good way, then you don't run the risk of deadlock because you've arranged it so that it won't. 
but it's much easier to write a program where S send will deadlock than if you use uh, a B send, because uh, B send, it doesn't matter. There are less synchronization points in your code. So there are less opportunities for it to cause deadlock. Um, so it may run faster with a, a buffered send because it can return to user code much faster, much earlier. So the transfer will happen at some point. You know, the receiver isn't ready yet. A buffered send will return immediately and allow you to continue doing some sort of computation work. Um, its disadvantage is that it will fail if you haven't got enough buffer space. So you have to know your code well enough to predict what's the maximum amount of buffer space I'm going to need at any point in my code. So MPI send attempts to, to solve those disadvantages um, by combining those two mechanisms. So the buffer space is provided by the system. The trouble is you can't, um, you can't tell how much will actually be provided by the system. That doesn't really matter because it can always fall back to using the ascend mode internally. So if, you, if internally MPI runs out of its own buffer space, it will use ascend, but that then does a synchronization. So you have to assume, sorry, yes? So just can't you control those buffers by environment or others? In some MPI libraries, yes. Oh, it's, not, it's, it's not standardized, um, but yes, most MPI libraries that allow you to set something um, and it gives you some, some level of control over that. Um, actually, if you, if you start looking at what you can set and customize in an MPI library, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of things you can set and change. Uh, that's just one of them. Um, so that does mean that the, the send, a standard send, is less likely to fail, either because of deadlock or because of... Um, you know, ex exhausting the buffer space. Um, but it does mean that you have to code assuming the worst is going to happen and it, it is going to synchronize like a S send would. So this is an example of the sort of deadlock you can get into with a, um, an S send. If these were S sends, that would certainly deadlock um, because Neither of the sends can finish until at least one of them gets to a receive, but neither of them can get to a receive because they're both blocked in the sends. That's a deadlock. So with a B send, that would be okay because they would both copy into buffers, immediately return, get to the receives, which then complete the, the two transfers. So if there is enough buffer space, a standard send will work in this case. If there isn't, it will revert back to a, a, an S send and it'll deadlock. So you can't write code like that even with, with send because you are running the risk that in some situations it will work and in others it won't. And by some situations I mean if you changed from one machine to another or from one MPI library to another, you may find there's a different amount of buffer space available and it, you're the same piece of code running with exactly the same input file will either deadlock in one situation or run complete, you know, completely fine in the other. So, possible solutions to this. Um, to avoid deadlock, match the sends and receives or the orders that these things are issued in um, yourself. So in the, in the process A, process B example so far, you could say that process A sends first and then receives, and process B receives first and then sends. That would achieve the same thing um, in, in that messages are going in both directions. A is sending something to B and B is so sending something back. But by switching the order of the instructions um, in B, you know that that cannot deadlock. Because one will always get to a receive and the other one will always get to a, a send. So for a more general um, solution, it's probably always better, if you're writing a code from scratch, it's better to, to start using um, an S send and a blocking receive. Having done that and make sure that you haven't got a deadlock in it, then you can start um, changing those, those blocking calls for non-blocking calls. Um, so I think there's, a, there's another lecture about non-blocking calls, so I'm not going to go into them here. Um, 
but that's that is a better way of solving this particular issue. Yes. Can you change the buffer size depending on the process? Like if you know process one needs an extra amount of memory than the other, so you need to set that into the So with with BSend, yes, because it's up to the user to provide the buffer space in the first place. So if you know that process one is going to need a megabyte, but process two and following ones are only going to need 100,000 bytes, then only attach that much using the buffer attach um, function call. So if process one attached something to process zero, okay. Yeah, so they, they can't use each other's buffer space, obviously, because their their process is so their memory um, is separated. So if process one attaches a megabyte, it has a megabyte of buffer space available for bsend, but process two has nothing at that point. It has to attach its own buffer space from its own memory address space. Um, so yes, in that, in that way, you could control it per process if you knew that much detail about your code. Um, potentially, with the environment variables um, that were mentioned over here, um, if the MPI library was, was kind to you and you could do it, then you might be able to set the environment variable differently for each process and thereby achieve the same thing for the internal buffer space, but I wouldn't guarantee it. So that's all I, I was going to say about modes. Is there any questions about that just before I move on to tags? Can't see everybody. Nope. Okay. So tags. Um, every message, every point-to-point -point message can have a tag. Um, they all do have a tag because the send, it's mandatory in the send call. Um, you can set them all to the same value, zero, for example. It's a non-negative integer value. Um, there is a maximum value, which isn't mentioned here, possibly. OK, anyway, there is a maximum value. Um, it's about 32,000 or so. As, as an absolute minimum, it must be at least 32,000. Um, so you've got quite a lot to play with if you want to use them. Not everyone does use them. Um, there's some good use cases for them. There are some terrible use cases for them. Um, it can be very useful for, um, for debugging if you want to tag each, each type of message that you send so that when you've got an unmatched send coming in or you've got a send that's matching a receive and you're not really sure whether it should have done or not, then you can sort of tag messages and say it's a type 1 message so it really ought not to be matching that receive. It's very useful for debugging purposes. Um, it is also useful in, in some applications where you actually want to use the tags to mean something and you want to send several different types of message simultaneously and, but only pick out all the type 1 messages. Um, if you don't know what the frequency of the messages that you're going to send, potentially you, you actually have lots of type 1 messages and a few type 2s. Um, so you can tag them separately so that you can pull out all the type 2 messages and process them without touching any of the type 1 messages. You don't have to send them in order. Um, so it can be very useful. Um, tag is most commonly used, I think, with the MPI any tag um, on the receiver side. MPI any tag ma matches any tag that was sent. Don't care. Ignore it effectively. Um, so that can also be quite useful. Um, it's the same uh, process as the MPI any source for wildcarding with the source where it comes from. Um, so you can always find out which value tag had at the sender by looking at the status object once the receive has finished. So that's tags. So communicators. Communicators are a, quite a good feature um, in MPI. Um, so all MPI communications take place within the context of a communicator. A communicator is fundamentally a group of processes, MPI processes, um, and a communication context for that group. So that means that you can isolate one set of communications from another set. Uh, if you send a message using a particular communicator, it must be received by that communicator. It can't be received by a receive issued with a different communicator. It is completely isolated. Um, the groups can overlap. 
the groups can overlap, and indeed they will as soon as you create a second one. Um, so the, the two communicators that are provided for you when you initialize MPI are MPI com world, which contains all of the processes in the entire application, and MPI com self, which is just you. So those two groups immediately overlap because self is always in com world. So, and also all the selves don't, that are disjoint, obviously it includes one, each one. So yes, both, both situations are valid. Um, so yeah, I've mentioned com world. Um, a message can only be received within that communicator. So unlike tags and source, it's not possible to wildcard on communicator. You must specify the right one. So, so you can split com world into pieces. So this example um, is splitting com world into two disjoint pieces. They don't overlap. Um, obviously, you could repeat this process again and create another communicator um, that splits it differently, and then they would they would definitely overlap. Um, so com1 and com2 here don't overlap, they're disjoint, but they do overlap with com world, both of them, because they sort of have to. Com world can, includes everything. So each process has a unique rank within each subcommunicator that it's actually a member of. Um, so just because your rank is one in com world does not mean to say your rank will be one in any other communicator. It might be, it might not be. You have a different number in each one. It's simply the, the ordering within that communicator, within that group. So here, for example, um, rank zero in COM world is rank zero in COM one, but it's not even in COM two. It's not part of the group. So rank four in COM world isn't in COM one at all, but it's rank zero in COM two. So in which case you actually need to ask questions. If you're going to use a communicator other than com world, you need to ask the question, um, how big is this particular communicator? It will probably be smaller than com world. Um, and what is my rank in that one? You can't assume that your rank is the same in all of them. It's not. Okay. Um, so uses of communicators it's a good idea to not use the symbol MPI com world in your code, um, apart from the very first time you use it, which is to duplicate com world. Um, so it, it is possible, it, indeed, it's, a, it's at least a, a one good idea is to just use a variable to refer to it. Don't use MPI com world throughout your, your code. Use some variable that you made up, com, for example, my com, something. Um, and set that to the same value as this. That will make your code a lot easier to change later when you decide that you don't actually want to use com world, you want to use something else. Um, so rather than going through your code and changing that, that to something else, you can just change what this value is at the top and your code will still work. So it doesn't actually say how there, I think. No, it doesn't say how. Um, you can Duplicate it with MPI com dupe. There's a DUP uh, is the function you'd want to duplicate a, um, a communicator. So communicators allow processes to communicate with each other safely within a piece of code. In particular here, we, we really mean libraries. If you're a library writer, you're writing a library, like a, a fast Fourier transform is the one that's on the slide here. Um, how do you guarantee that the messages that you, you want to send from one library instance to another don't interfere with the messages that the user wants to send from the application processes? The way you do it is you um, create your own communicator and you don't tell the application about it. Then you can use that communicator, but the application does not have any reference to that communicator and cannot interfere with your communications. And vice versa, the library can't interfere with the application either. So this means that you've got two completely isolated worlds to communicate in. You can't affect each other. Um, it's not really safe to do that same thing with tags. You could 
sort of try and do it. You know, I'll, I'll use the, the lowest four bytes of four bits of the tag and you use the rest, something like that. But then as soon as the application issues a, a receive with MPI any tag, you're, you're lost because <laughs> it will receive your messages. So, in summary, um, why bother with all the send modes? It's complicated. Mostly they're there from, for historical reasons. Um, all of these modes existed before MPI did, so MPI standardized all of them rather than trying to choose which one was best. The reason it did that is because that in different situations, all of them come out as the best. So there, there are particular situations where vSend is the thing that you want to use. There are particular other situations where vSend is terrible, but you want to use a, a synchronous send. That's the best thing and so on. There are particular pieces of hardware that were around at the time where one of them doesn't make any sense, the others do, and so on. So that is still sort of true. Um, machines have converged quite a lot, but they, are, they all have their uses. Um, so the differences, I hope, are clearer to you as to which one does what and what you can expect from each of them. Um, S send will synchronize, B send will not, um, and the send can be either. Um, this is MPI trying to be helpful and sometimes tying you in knots that you didn't expect. So the amount of system buffer space is variable. You should never assume that the send is asynchronous. You should never assume more than zero bytes of internal buffer space. It is perfectly OK for MPI to provide no buffer space internally whatsoever, in which case every single send will be an S send, and all of them will synchronize. You must assume the worst case. Just because it works on one system doesn't mean to say it will work on another. What are tags for? Well, the simple answer is if you don't need them, don't use them. Um, if you do need them, then you know why. You know the answer to the question. So one of the possible answers is debugging, as I mentioned earlier. Um, always tag messages with the rank of the sender. Always tag messages with the type of message so that you know whether it should have matched that receive or not. That sort of idea. Um, can I just use com world? Yes. Please don't. <laughs> Um, yes, you can, but it's, it's very, very simple to do, um, as is here, uh, declare a communicator variable, set that um, to com world, and then in all future um, occurrences where you need a communicator, just use com, not MPI com world. And then if you decide that actually you want to change this and you don't want to use com world anymore, you want to use half of com world, you can do a, a split of com world in the top two lines here. And instead of setting com to MPI com world, you can set it to com one, for example, from the picture before. And you're using less ranks. The rest of the code will still work. It just assume that the size is smaller than it was. Um, but it works out what its, its rank and size is using these two calls at the bottom here. It doesn't matter how big it is. So your code will be a lot easier to maintain if you don't use MPI com world directly. I think that's all I need to say. Are there any questions on that? Or anything else? Yes. When you create your own subcom vacator, can you how do you specify what it's supposed to be look like? Like what the size should be and so there are there are quite a few um, routines that can create new communicators. Um, depending on exactly what you want to do. So if you want to, so the one that was mentioned on one of the slides is MPI com split. Com split um, job really is to split the parent communicator into disjoint subgroups. So that's what it was doing on the picture there. It, it, all of the processes that were there still are, but they're in diff different groups now. And you create some communicators. Each process is only in one of them. Um, but there's also MPI com create group where you give it a group. Here are the group. Here's the group. Create me a communicator out of that group. Uh, 
Yes, it's slightly more complicated to do that. So in with a com, com split, um, you actually specify that. Um, there's There are parameters um, where you specify a key and a color effectively, and it, it basically says, um, take my rank, apply this, this algorithm to it, and you will get which group I'm supposed to be in. Um, and then, and you, so you could work out your order, and in, therefore you will get that rank. Um, you can also um, take the group of each of the two communicators and ask MPI, so which one am I in each of these groups? And then that will give you that answer as well. So if I, if I just gave you two random communicators, you could ask which rank am I in each one just by doing com rank. But you can also translate the ranks from one to another. So I know that I was communicating with rank three in the other communicator. Which rank in this new communicator is, was the same process as rank three? What's its rank in this communicator? So there are a whole bunch of functions that you can do that sort of manipulation. If you're using tags, mm -hmm. and as you said, you've got some messages tag one, some tag two, mm -hmm. and you are only pulling off tag twos in your receive calls, mm -hmm. presumably the receive buffer can overflow with tag ones. Is that ever a problem? So it sort of depends what you mean by a receive buffer. I haven't actually said that there is one. Right. <laughs> the RMPI library might have one, but it doesn't actually have to have one. Um, what, it, what the senders will all have done is notify the receiver that it has some message that it needs to deliver. It probably won't have actually delivered them all. Um, so the header information will have arrived. And yes, eventually you would, have, you would exhaust memory with all of the headers. But the headers are only you know, 20, 30 bytes, something like that, independent of how big the message is. So it won't have delivered all those messages. There is no receive buffer with all this data piling up. There is just the headers, the notifications, all these messages are out there waiting. So yes, you would eventually exhaust memory with that, but you'd be there a long time trying to do it. Um. So um, if you took one of the if you took one of the existing libraries, um, Fast Fourier Transform Library, for example, it will have been written so that it won't use Comworld. It will use a duplicate of Comworld, or it will use a it will duplicate whatever communicator you give it. You will say, use this communicator to communicate with, you know, on, and it will it will duplicate that inside, and not actually use the communicator you told it to use. So it, it will create its own little universe and off it goes busy doing its, its communication on that. The rest of the application can then do whatever it likes on any communicator it can get hold of because it can't get hold of the one that's inside the library. The library won't release that to you. Um, and there is no way of finding out that such a communicator exists. So you can't interfere with it and it can't interfere with you. Um, so yes, if the, the question can be expanded to if you're writing the library and the application, then you need, to, you need to do that process yourself. Um, it's very easy to do. You can just duplicate the thing you're given. The application will give you a communicator handle and say, here, use this to communicate. And you just duplicate it and hand it back. And then you're not actually using the, the communicator the application has access to. You're using your own one in the library. <laughs> 